And Elizabeth, we're ready to start when you are. Okay, I apologize if there's a little bit of background noise. Um, I just finished presenting for a, a conference in Austin. So let me go here. Hopefully you're here for tips and trips of inexpensive accessibility testing. Uh, my legal department always makes me add this, that this does not constitute legal or professional advice. Please contact Michael if you have any questions about what we're covering in this presentation. So my name is Elizabeth Simister. I am the Product Accessibility Manager with Blackboard. Uh, I've been doing this since 2004 when I started at Cornell University uh, as a research assistant. And they're like, oh, you're an IT person. You get this technology stuff. Make all of our economics PDFs accessible. So we're talking graphs. We're talking math. And we're talking 2004. Um, lots of fun and joy. I kind of learned the hard way. Uh, I've been with Blackboard for about two years now, and basically my role is to do what I can to make sure that anything going out the door is accessible to everybody. And if people have questions, I do have my chat open, so please, you know, feel free to raise a hand or ask at any point. So what am I going to cover in the next hour or so? Uh, the pros and cons of using automated testing tools for applications, how to test for accessibility in web software, native mobile apps using tools other than assistive technologies, how to check for accessibility of documentation, audio files, video files, how hardware like kiosks and keypads are tested for accessibility, and what the difference is between accessibility, usability, and bugs. So automated testing. There are pros and cons to automated testing. Pros, it's fast. You're going to get results really quickly. One of the catches is it's only about 25% of all issues. The pro is there's several free tools out there. Some of the cons, you will get false positives. It catches about 25% of all possible issues. Each tool is different. Uh, you need to set what conformance you want to use. Some of them use best practices instead of actual language. And there can be inconsistency in how results are displayed. I'm actually going to go back to it the automated testing and elaborate on this for a second. In terms of the free tools, right, um, some of you may be using our Ally tool, which is great. That's one of the many out there. Uh, there are some others that you can definitely find that will be similar. When I'm talking about how each tool is different, you can run Ally, you can run the WebAIM Wave tool, and sometimes you'll get two different answers. And the reason for that is that these tools use math to kind of say what is or is not actually working. Um, and depending on the math that is set, Travis, I'll, I'll get you in a second, um, that can definitely change the answers. Yes, Travis? Travis, did you have a question? Travis, no. please type your question into the chat. There, um, the audio is turned off. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh oh. Um, I, actually, I'm using Chrome and I can hear her just fine. Um, possibly try uh, getting back into the session. So are we okay if I keep going? Okay. Thank you. Um, so
So manual testing, and I'm covering software, web, and native apps here. So non-automated steps to test for accessibility are things like color contrast, high contrast, keyboard only, uh, zoom, and code review. And then we have assistive technologies. So color contrast, right? There are new, now two different parts to this. First of all, there's the one that most people are probably familiar with, is that your text must be a ratio of 4.5 to 1 if it is less than 24 pixels or 19 pixels bold. The rule actually says 18 point or 14 point, but since a lot of people don't develop with point, they develop with pixels, I usually you know, translate that to something people will get. Um, a minimum for things like text that is bigger than 24 pixels or 19 pixels uh, is 3 to 1, right? And 3 to 1 is not only for text anymore. It's also for things like images that have meaning. So if you're using an image button, that's got to have a certain color contrast. And for things like focus cues. So if we're talking about somebody navigating with their keyboard from one field to the next in a form, that focus has to be big enough that somebody can see it, bold enough that they can see it. This is also going to apply to your form fields. So things around your form fields, you have to know that a text box is a text box. It's got to have some visual cue that it is a text box. That also has to be three to one. Links, they also have to be three to one. So this particular thing is going to hit a really wide variety of things that you're gonna to need to check. So you're gonna to wanna to use some type of color contrast checker to compare the foreground, aka text, image, visible cue, against the background color, right? And you're gonna to wanna to confirm that the hex or RGB values in the code when possible, because that's gonna give you the most accurate information, or use a picker, right? So sometimes if you're looking at images, and you're looking at image contrast, it's a little harder to figure out what the hex or RGB values are for that. So you're probably gonna need some type of picker tool. What I've got on the image on this particular page is a couple of different free tools that are out there. The color contrast checker with the value 8.59 to one, that is by WebAIM. This one will require hex values. The second tool that I have in here, which is using the same exact values, is been created by the Passiello group. This particular tool has a checker or a picker. Still no sound. Uh-oh. I'm definitely talking and my mic is moving. Anybody else having issues? It might be a little echoey, so I apologize for that. Okay. All right. No, quite clear. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's not necessarily a good thing. Um, so as I was saying, the second image, the smaller image, is the Passiello group. They have a picker tool. They also have the ability to uh, use RGB colors. So if you have an RGB value, you can use that to kind of confirm what is or is not. Um, does everybody understand if they need to do audio via the phone how to do that? Oh, that's a good point. If you go up to the um, top left of your screen where the hamburger um, icon is and click there, you will get um, an option to use your phone for audio um, and that will give you a number to dial in. So that may be a, um, a workaround for anyone who's still having sound issues. The session, again, is being recorded, and you will receive a copy of the recording. <clears throat> um, but I know that's not quite the same as being in, in it live. So hopefully right. using your phone mm -hmm. will, um, will take care of that situation. And absolutely stop me at any time if people have questions um, related to what I'm covering.
So one of the other free things that you can do is check the high contrast mode. And there's some different ways that you can do this, right? What you're going to want to verify is that all content remains visible in the application. Uh, visible focus cues are still evident. And color alone has not been used to communicate information. On a computer, and when I say on a computer, this is typically on a PC. You're going to change the display to high contrast setting via the operating system. Then open the application. Do not open the application, then open the high contrast because it doesn't always pull it in. Open the application and kind of look at it and make sure that you can actually still see everything and that it looks correct. You can do this on a mobile device as well. Typically, you're going to go to the accessibility features um, in something like General or on, a, on an iPhone. Um, you can go in there. You'll look for accessibility features. And you can invert colors. And then they have similar features, which will allow you to uh, change to like a grayscale or enhanced color contrast. So you're going to want to try those if you're in a mobile environment. You can see that I have a picture here. Uh, what I actually did for this, this does not always work, is I used the Google color contrast tool to just give me a quick and dirty idea of if I put this particular page, and it happens to be our help site, into a yellow text, black background, can I get all the information? And thankfully, the answer is yes. I can get all of the information that I need in this page. OK, so keyboard only, right? Um, keyboard only is really critical to test for a variety of reasons. It's not just because, oh, we think that some motor and motor mobility impaired users are going to navigate with just the keyboard. Keyboard only is really critical for people who use speech to text tools, like Dragon Naturally Speaking. Uh, screen reader users don't typically use mice, so they need to be able to navigate with the keyboard. Um, some screen magnifier users also tend to use the keyboard. So that's why we like to do at least some basic level of keyboard-only testing, right? So what kinds of things are you going to verify? You're going to make sure that everything that is supposed to receive keyboard focus receives focus. So things like your menus, links, buttons, form fields, those should get keyboard focus. Only interactive elements receive keyboard focus, right? So if you're navigating and you see just plain text getting keyboard focus, that's going to be actually a fail. And the reason that interactive elements or non-interactive elements, so like headings and plain text or labels, should not get keyboard focus is that as a sighted person who is using a speech-to-text tool or who's using an alternative device to navigate, like the keyboard, every time I have to tab, you're adding uh, a layer of complexity for me. So if I'm sighted, I'm using my keyboard, and I hit the tab key, and you're putting me on a heading, that's one extra navigation step that I have to do. And if I've got carpal tunnel, that's going to hurt after a little bit. So we want to make sure that only interactive elements receive keyboard. For those that are going, well, what about screen reader users? Screen reader users actually have an alternative way to navigate just text context, right? They are able to go through an application using their arrow keys. Um, with JAWS, we call that virtual cursor. And that's going to be how they pick up on things like their headings, on lists, some of the labels. It's typically actually how they're going to navigate to form fields to begin with or other interactive elements. Um, it may only be a novice JAWS user that will actually use the tab key to navigate to content. So that's why when you're checking it, 
you don't want to have interactive or non-interactive elements receiving keyboard focus. Is there a skip navigation me uh, method available for pages with a lot of navigation or content? Now, skip navigation does not have to be actually visible on the page when you start to navigate. So if you're going to put your focus in the browser window and you're going to start moving through the next item in that list as you're navigating through should get focus, keyboard focus, and it should be your skip navigation. And that's on pages with a lot of content or navigation, right? You don't necessarily need a skip navigation link on a page with just your login information, right? That's kind of duplicative. You don't really need it. It's just going to add an extra step for somebody to do. There is a highly visible focus cue on interactive elements that have focus. The reason that we do that is to make sure that somebody who is using an alternative device, like their keyboard, or what we call switches, which are pretty much what they sound like, they're big button things that somebody can tap in order to place focus in different places. If I'm using my voice, I know exactly where I am. I know what form field that I am in or what button or navigation element I am going to interact with. Highly visible focus cues are also really helpful for somebody who is low vision or has color imperative uh, in, um, impairments because they're again, they know where they are on the page and that's really critical. That the navigation order makes sense for how the content is arranged. Um, one of the things that drives me absolutely nuts every time I have to pay my personal taxes is the form field that my county uses does not have a navigation order that makes sense when I'm using my keyboard. It goes from my first name and then it goes from left over to right, which is my last name, and then it goes back down to my middle name. That does not make sense to me. I want it to be my first name, middle name, last name. It's you want to make sure that whatever you're doing is going to make sense. Another thing to think about when you're thinking about keyboard navigation and the order is what if you're in a responsive environment, right? Uh, one example I give, uh, before I started at Blackboard, I used to do consulting and testing. And I was navigating this page on a computer, and as I tabbed through, my focus went to the right side of the screen, and then it went back to the left side of the screen, which was weird. I then put the page into a responsive view and did the same thing, and it made sense. The way that they had structured it is that they had like floats and stuff, for those that are kind of uh, cascading style sheet smart. They had floated it in such a way that when it went into responsive, the two went vertical and the left or the right side went over the left side. So when you're navigating in on a computer, it didn't make sense, but responsive it did. You definitely want to make sure that you're navigating with a keyboard and that it makes sense for how the content is arranged. How to verify. Most people know that you're going to do this with your tab, spacebar, enter, and arrow keys, right? Tab is typically to get from form field to form field. Uh, so like an edit field or a checkbox, your buttons, your links. Uh, spacebar is used with buttons. Spacebar and enter can be used with buttons together. Obviously not at the same time, but if you use a you can use enter on a button and that'll be fine. Enter keys should only be used on links. If you are on something that looks like a button, and you cannot hit a spacebar, that is a fail. Arrow keys to navigate. Arrow keys are going to be used in things like radio buttons to move between the radio buttons or up and down in a menu. So like a select field or drop down menu. That's when you're going to use your arrow keys. And then use spacebar in order to select that. Right? 
That's what the expected behavior is for these basic keyboard commands. Use shortcut keys such as control P for print as needed, just to make sure that they're not being overridden. And say you have a print button, the application is supposed to be able to take you to the print, you want to make sure that you can do control P to actually get to that print. Object inspector, okay? Microsoft makes this tool. Uh, the Paciello group has a similar tool. What object inspector does is it will tell you things like does a form field have a name is it correct is the form field actually interactive and does it actually get keyboard focus so this is a free tool that's available in windows environments that i strongly recommend that folks check out because it is a huge huge time saver when you're trying to understand a page um, I also want to I also put a note on here some assistive technology users are able to attach Bluetooth keyboards to their devices so you want to make sure that if you have something like a tablet that you're connecting it to a keyboard and testing that application with the keyboard now granted testing the native app uh, with a keyboard on in a native app is a slightly different prospect um, in this case you should still not be putting focus on interactive elements. It should only be going to, uh, or non-interactive elements, it should only be going to interactive elements. Uh, same idea, if it's coded correctly, if a form field is coded correctly in a native app, it should be announcing to a voiceover user or a talkback user what the purpose of that field is. I don't need it as a sighted person to know what that field is, or if I'm using speech to text. Okay, Zoom, right? People have probably heard that you've got to blow up your screen. Uh, this is mostly for um, web, but it also does apply to native and mobile apps and software. You want to make sure that your content is still available. And on this page, again, I have an example of our help site that is, in fact, up to 200%. And you can see that you can get to all the left-hand navigation. You can get to the pieces within that, so the little tiles that are on that, and then the, the uh, right-hand navigation, which is acting as a table of contents. Um, you're not losing any information. How do you do this? In a browser, you're typically going to go to View and then increase it to 200%. Select the magnifier or zoom option from the computer operating system. Or again, if you're on a native app or in your mobile device, you can go to the accessibility features and they often have a zoom feature there that will allow you to set it to about 200%. And then you're gonna actually wanna navigate with the mouse uh, if you're on a computer, gestures if you're in a mobile environment, and the keyboard. Because sometimes what happens, like I said, when you magnify this, you can't get to all of the content. Zoom is really important for people who are using screen magnifying, right? So somebody who's low vision but has some sight needs to be able to blow up your page or your native app or your software application large enough that they can see it. And if you haven't done it correctly, sometimes that information can get cut off. So if you fix your viewport, you're gonna figure that out really fast when you blow it up to 200 and all of a sudden you don't have your horizontal or vertical scroll bar so in a browser. Okay. Code review. Code review is something that I considered a advanced technique because you actually have to know something about code. Um, this is one of the best things to do if you've run automated testing. If you don't know that much about code, definitely get somebody who does to look at it and say, okay, I see that there is an issue here, right, that came out of this page's testing, but it's actually related to this page over here. Um, and that happens a lot in applications where developers have basically hidden 
information within their code that doesn't apply to the page that you're currently testing, but it may apply someplace else in the application. So if you're running an automated testing tool, typically my behavior, what I do is I'll look at that code and make sure the issue is actually valid for the page that I was testing. I double check. Yep, that's one thing you can definitely do. Um, double check all of the images to make sure that the alternative text makes sense for the purpose, right? Cat is not a cheetah. There is a difference. A cheetah is a cat, but it is a cat is not necessarily a cheetah. And you want to make sure that if there's alternative text that it makes sense for the image that it is used on. Double check form fields to make sure that they are actually labeled and the labels make sense for the purpose of the field. There was a new uh, rule, new guideline that came up with uh, WCAG 2.1 or WCAG 2.1 that requires the visible label match any hidden label within a form field. So there's something that is used called a placeholder. And usually it's that light gray text that says type, you know, type first name here that you might see in a form field. If you have something like that, it must say the exact same thing in a hidden label, however that hidden label is been coded. So if I see it as a placeholder, I've also got to hear it the same way. The reason for that is one, make sure that screen reader users understand what that field is. And two, if I'm using a speech to text tool like Dragon, I can say edit tech, type in first name field. And my focus is going to go correctly into that field. Because if they don't match, I'm not going to be able to use my tool. So it's really, really critical to make sure that form fields match. Confirm hex and RGB values for color contrast ratios. There again, this is a very, this is slightly more advanced technique. Um, you're going to want to look at what we call the cascading style sheet or the CSS to see what the text and the for or the text or the the text contrast and the body contrast are. Um, like I said, that'll give you the most reliable color contrast. A lot of automated testing tools now are bringing color contrast into the picture in terms of what they're pulling back. Um, if you look at Ally, for example, right, it will say you need to double check the color contrast on this image or on this text. Most automated testing tools are not sophisticated enough to get that 100% right because they're kind of taking a picture of the color against the background and then they're running their math in the background saying we think this is the hex value for these two items and if we think it's this value and this value the color contrast ratio is not high enough to meet the WCAG requirements so we're going to flag it as a warning and let somebody know that they have to go look at it yep that's another tool that you can absolutely use check the JavaScript right? Uh, Firefox actually has this ability to kind of make sure that there are what you call keyboard event handlers. And it's really important in what we call ARIA-based controls. Now this is web only. Um, a lot of times developers who are new to using ARIA, they'll use mouse events only. So if I am trying to say click button with Dragon, I can't click the button because it doesn't have the right event handler on it for me to do that. If I am trying to interact with that with my screen reader, it's not going to feel my key press when I press the space bar around that button. So you want to make sure whenever possible that there are keyboard event handlers, right? To make sure that somebody with a keyboard can actually interact with that element. And there again, a tool like MSA Object Inspector will help you with that. Make sure that non-native form elements have the correct keyboard commands enabled. 
So this would be software and native mobile apps. There are plenty of times that I have seen software and native apps where they're doing custom controls and they forget to put the keyboard on it. And these tools are pretty easy, relatively easy to make sure that you've got your, your keyboard events on them. So there again, if you have the ability to look at that code and kind of verify it, I strongly recommend that you go in and just kind of make sure if you're keyboard testing, you can't get to an element, go into the code, did they make sure to put that on? Yes, no, great. Assistive technologies, and I consider this advanced, right? And I'm actually going to talk about why not to test with assistive technologies. I had a client who said, your application is failing because I can't get to this with TAP. And I asked them to send me a video of what they were doing, and they were right. It was failing with JAWS because they were just using their tab key. They were not familiar enough with the actual way that a JAWS, nav uh, JAWS user will navigate using what I said virtual cursor and their arrow keys. So they were missing a lot of context about what was on the page and therefore to them it failed. Now if they'd had somebody who was familiar with the assistive technology there's likely issues that they would have caught, but they would have had more context in terms of how to navigate that page. Screen reader users have the ability, as well as other assistive technology users, can set their um, tools to pick up certain kinds of information. And if you are not familiar with that, those um, options, you might miss some of the content. If you're only using Zoom text with the mouse, you may miss content that is not accessible with the shortcut keys. Um, low vision users who they have sight at the moment, but they're starting to lose said sight, typically start learning Zoom text first. Zoom text and JAWS have a lot of the same commands. Zoom text also has a text to speech uh, quality to it, so you can navigate through and hear content like you would with JAWS. So that's kind of how some users get acclimated to using the JAWS tool. When you're in JAWS, you're typically not going to use your mouse. So if you're just using Zoom text and you're not using the shortcut keys or you're not using the keyboard in general, if you're only using it with the mouse, because that's the way some Zoom text users use it, Zoom text, by the way, is a screen magnifying tool, you're going to miss information. Uh, not using correct voice commands with Dragon may make it seem like form fields are not accessible. And in part, that goes back to some of the yeah, it may have been mislabeled, but if I'm not using the correct command to begin with, I may not actually be able to access that. And I'm not saying don't use assistive technologies, I'm just saying that if you don't know what you're doing, it, doing with it, it's probably better to avoid. Okay, that being said, there are some technologies out there for folks to use. NVDA is a screen reader tool. Uh, it typically is used with Firefox. It's gotten extremely robust over the years. It has a lot of the same keyboard commands that JAWS has. And it, if you want to check something, you don't want to pay for a JAWS license, this is my advice, is to use NVDA. Uh, JAWS, you can get a 40 minute mode. You can also get a 40 minute mode of the Zoom Text screen magnifier. You can get a demo of the Dragon Naturally Speaking, so if you want to do that. Teacher version of Read and Write Gold is a literacy software, and it basically helps students with 
disabilities like dyslexia, it'll highlight the words or the letters and read it out loud so that they can follow along. And then Kurzweil is similar to Read and Write Gold, where it will highlight content and allow a user with something like dyslexia to follow along with that text. The last thing I have on here is Ease of Access Center that has things like Narrator. It's gotten better. It's still not great, but it's a free screen reader tool. Uh, the magnifier tool, same kind of thing. That's where you're going to get your high contrast is in the Ease of Access Center within uh, Windows. If you are using an Apple device, and this is pretty much the same for both PCs, or both for the computer, and for things like iPads and iPhones. VoiceOver screen reader software, Zoom screen magnifier, and these are actually built into the operating system of Apple devices. Siri for your speech to text, the teacher version, again, of Read and Write Gold, that's just for computers. Curse Wheel, which is, again, just for computers. And other native accessibility features. So things like Invert Color or Grayscale, um, Keyboard, those are all within the Apple domain. And because I'm talking about native apps, and I'm also wanting to talk about Android, now, I'm saying TalkBack screen reader. There's a new one out there. I haven't learned too much about it, to be fair. But um, thank you, Christopher. Um, web captioner, online speech to text. Um, TalkBack also has a screen, screen magnifier. And again, just like an iPhone or an iPad, it has other native features that will allow you to just color or bold text or increase the font size of the text. And that's one of the reasons why I also say avoid using uh, assistive technology sometimes unless you know what you're doing, because there's so many out there on the market. Documentation. Right? Why am I covering documentation when I'm talking about testing? It's one of the common things that higher education and K-12 institutions struggle with. It's pretty easy to check yourselves. So on this particular page, I actually have a screenshot of the accessibility checker from a PowerPoint that I was doing and intentionally did not put alternative text on some of the images I had. What you're going to do in both Word and PowerPoint is you're going to navigate from the main toolbar, select Review. You're going to navigate to and select Check Accessibility. That's going to open the Accessibility Checker panel. You're going to navigate into the inspection results. Any issues will be listed there, or will be, uh, if you're lucky, there will be no accessibility issues found message. Select issues to read from that list. And at the bottom of that Accessibility Checker, you're also going to have uh, tools and tips in order to fix your accessibility, right? Uh, one of the things that this does not necessarily cover, again, that you do need to consider is color contrast. There, that's where you can use a tool like the Passiello uh, Color Contrast Analyzer, because that will give you the ability to pick the colors or use the RGB values in order to make sure that you're actually meeting color contrast requirements. PDFs. Now, this is a very simplified step for making sure that your PDF is, in fact, accessible. Um, I am currently attending a conference where they literally had a three-hour workshop on how to do this. The basics, first of all, make sure that you have Adobe Acrobat Pro, because it will not work in just Adobe uh, Acrobat DC. You're going to go to the Tools page. You're going to make sure that your accessibility feature is enabled. And if it's not, you're going to need to make sure that it is enabled. You're then going to open the document that you want to check. You'll navigate the Tools pane, and that will be on the right side of your screen. You're going to select Accessibility from there. That should open the panel. There again, that actually opens on the right side of the screen. I typically navigate to and select Full Check. They do have options that you can have to narrow down if there's only certain things that you want to check. That's actually going to open a window. 
right? You're going to navigate to, you're going to start checking. Once that is done, right, you're definitely going to need to manually check, order, etc. Thank you, Christopher. Um, once you're done, the checker and the results are actually going to open on the left side of your screen, right? You're going to navigate into the accessibility checker, your report. You're going to navigate to each item with issues, and then when you're selecting that item, it's going to explain how to fix them. Um, Christopher in the chat is saying, you know, definitely checking for uh, things like your read order, your new titles, text that's not showing up in the outline mode, etc. I didn't put that into this presentation because that's definitely a lot more detailed and advanced. And there again, like I said, I started with PDFs, um, and it can be really, really challenging. Uh, it's something that you're going to need some time to learn and play with. And it's really easy, even now, in the most current version of Acrobat, to screw up your reading order. <laughs> so it's something that's definitely, yes, I believe that the presentations will be available afterwards. Um, they do. MS uh, Accessibility Checker and PDF. Part of that is if you do a save as PDF rather than export to, if you've done everything perfectly in setting up your PowerPoint or Word doc from an accessibility standpoint, if you save it, those tags that you've put into your native document do not transfer over. So you definitely want to make sure that you're doing export to PDF and not save as, or else you're going to end up having to redo everything in the PDF. Audio and video files. What are you going to want to verify? All audio files have text descriptions and captions, right? All videos have text descriptions, captions, and audio description as needed. What is audio description, right? Audio description is a um, text narration of what is occurring in the video. So if you think about um, Endgame, Avengers Endgame. There are tons of these really loud scenes where there's stuff exploding and people are moving all over the place. What somebody who's blind is going to need is some type of description of that action because there's not going to be a lot of dialogue at that point to kind of put things in context. They're just going to hear the big booms. They're not going to know that Groot's getting blown up. I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know if Groot gets blown up for those of you who know who Groot is. But that's something that they're going to want to make sure is added to provide additional description about what is happening visually that has significant meaning in the video. Now, if it's something like what I'm doing here where I'm talking a lot and I'm describing things that are on the screen, you don't necessarily need to have that audio description, right? A talking head does not necessarily need audio description. Something like a big action scene in a movie, might need audio description. Uh, how are you going to verify? You're going to open that audio video file. You're going to make sure there's captions, that there is a caption button. The caption text is synced to the audio content. So later on, if somebody's looking at the captions in this, my voice as I'm talking is to match what I'm talking about on the screen, right? Uh, the caption text is the same text as the audio text. So hopefully my cart person, um, as they're writing this, isn't accidentally misspelling things. Or if we use YouTube, that some of my words aren't garbled, because that can be a problem. Um, great, you've captioned it, but the captions don't make sense. And audio is, description is available for videos as needed. Um, and it's really kind of interesting. It's an anecdotal story. When Netflix released the the series Daredevil. Daredevil is about a blind uh, lawyer who is a vigilante. They didn't add audio description into that. And the blind community just went into an uproar. Uh, Daredevil now has audio description. And every time, you want to make sure that you've got a text transcript for audio and video file, right? Text transcript helps those with deaf blindness. Now, it's not a huge population, 
but it's definitely important. It helps users with cognitive impairments who are trying to follow along sometimes. It may have difficulty trying to understand what's being said. It's another resource for visually impaired and hearing impaired users to make sure they understand what's being in the video. And on this page, I actually have a screenshot of a reporting that I did um, to kind of suggest that it needs captions. Hardware. Some of you may not think about hardware when you're thinking about testing, but um, you do, especially if you're buying things like printers or phones, uh, the kiosks, if you have a cafeteria, right, and you're getting a little kiosk in to let students automatically order their food or whatnot. These things must be accessible, and you still must test them to make sure that they are, in fact, accessible. So one of the quick and dirty tricks is to make sure that you've got a tape measure and just measure out the height and the reach on a kiosk. So if you're thinking something like an ATM machine, is that to spec per the Section 508 guidelines, per ADA guidelines? Is there an audio jack? that you can connect into, right? If I am doing something private, where I have to put in my social security number for any reason, I don't want everybody around me to hear that. I need to be able to make that private for myself. Can the audio be adjusted, right? Uh, if I have a hearing aid, or even if I just want to raise the volume or lower the volume because it's too loud, can I do that? If there's a touch screen, um, I was in an, an environment once where I was testing a kiosk and every time I went hand across the screen, it changed. That's not good because if I have a motor impairment, the screen's changing before I can interact with it and it's giving me error messages. So you want to make sure that if you have a touch screen, that the content doesn't just change. But you also want to make sure that you don't have to put a ton of force on it to actually get it to change. Which brings me to my next point. Verify there is a keypad. Keypads are great for people with both motor impairments and they're critical for people who are blind. You are allowed to use color or there is allowed to be color on that keypad as long as there are other physical and visual cues. So think about something that has a nib or like the triangle versus the circle when you're going through your card reader at the checkout counter. That's why those keypads, when you're doing your credit card, have the different shapes or the different feelings. There's a nib where a five is raised so that people can put in perspective where their fingers are on that keypad. If software is being built in house, use the non-automated testing section to confirm that things like character height, color contrast, are in fact met. Some of these may be challenging with other things that you're buying. Uh, if you don't have the ability to do that in-house. So accessibility, usability, and other bugs. Um, when you're testing, things to kind of think about when you're categorizing stuff, right? Still a bug, still an issue, you still need to document it. All accessibility issues are usability issues, but not all usability issues are just accessibility issues, okay? How to tell the difference. If the code is following HTML5 or ARIA 1.1 specification and the JavaScript has all the correct event handlers, then it might be a usability, not an accessibility issue, right? So like I said, we had a client who was tabbing through everything and saying they couldn't get to text only content. The code was accurate, the RE was accurate, the form fields were interactive, the buttons were interactive with the keyboard. It was a usability issue in this case, right? If you cannot easily replicate the issue, then it's probably a bug and not a usability or accessibility issue, right? If you're getting this weird message on the screen and it's intermittent and it's actually coming up even when you're using your mouse and no assistive technology, that's probably a bug. Or if it's coming up just periodically at random, that's probably a bug. 
all users have a similar experience. Um, yesterday, I was working with a team to design a sonification, right? Uh, example, sonification is using sound to represent visual actions. And when we got done with the design, we suddenly realized there's no reset button on this thing. That is a usability issue. This could also be a bug if everybody's suddenly getting a 404 error page at the same time. That's not necessarily a usability issue or an accessibility issue. That's a bug in general. Now, if multiple assistive technology users are having a similar experience, but you're not using your mouse, that's definitely an accessibility issue and you've got to flag it. Now, there's other things in here that I'm not including in terms of an accessibility issue versus a, a usability or bug. If the code is not following HTML5 or ARIA or JavaScript is incorrect, your CSS is wrong. Those are accessibility issues. Those fall under what we call parsing. Um, parsing is required to make sure that your code is correct and that it is following specification. So Christopher Dobson has been putting some extra tools in here but I also captured some of them in this uh, presentation. Some of the things to think about and use that are free, uh, Android provides a scanner. iOS, this is an older link, but it will get you to the newer place. Axe by DQ, Wave by WebAIM, Site Improve actually has a uh, accessibility tool that's free. Uh, I put in a list of accessibility consultants. I put in the links to the WebAIM color contrast checker, the Passiello contrast checker, the Passiello group A-Viewer, which is pretty similar to the Microsoft MSA Object Inspector tool. So some of the things that I've discussed today, that's where you can find them. And of course, when you're looking back through the chat, Christopher's been putting in some extra things in there as well. And so we're up to our last pie. Uh, slide here. Absolutely. I'm not going to leave people hanging. Um, do we have any questions? We've got about five minutes left. Collaborate accessibility. Uh, in terms of the Java product or the web-based product? So what we're using right now, Christopher, is a web-based product. Um, this is our Ultra tool. Oh God, for mobile, um, you can use it in a mobile environment. We have tested it in a mobile environment. It actually does work fairly well. Okay, so Sybil saying, with keyboard focus, if I play around with that in BB and there are issues, am I able to fix those on this? Um, you're a newbie. Uh, it, <laughs> I see Christopher just rewrote, good for mobile. Um, <laughs> instead of, oh, God, for mobile. I like the first one. Anyway, back to Sybil. Um, it depends on the focus issues. If your institution is using your own color contrast selections, that can definitely fear, interfere. So uh, if you're using an older theme, that might have some issues, and that's something you have to report back to us. Um, our newer, our ultra tool in Learn, uh, the Collaborate tool that we are currently using, those actually have been checked to make sure that the color contrast is meeting the minimum required. I believe it's actually 4.5, even though it only needs to be like three to one. So some of those things in our new, newer tools have definitely been checked. Okay, is this okay to use other free sites to fix PDFs? Um, if that's going to work and give you the right information, absolutely, Erin. You can totally use the pave-pdf.org/index.enhtml 
uh, site. I'm only putting in a limited number of things uh, here, but definitely, like I said, there's tons of stuff out there. Okay, we have the cheap PP. <laughs> Darn tootin'. And this is true. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to cover um, LA does not pick up keyboard focus. That's where you need to use the keyboard instructions I put in. Um, and there again, like I said, I included uh, a high level how to check for documents because it really is important that you understand audio, video, Word, PowerPoint, and PDF accessibility and how to test for those as well. Ally picks some of that information up. It's not necessarily going to get all of it. Um, and it's always good to know what about Blackboard Open MLS, Snap, etc. So in terms of Snap, yes, the Snap theme is definitely accessible. Um, we know we had some issues around headings. The color contrast in that is still based off of the Moodle, so there are some things around that that need to be fixed, and Moodle knows that. Um, started playing with Ally, very cool. I only have to redo my MS Word docs, but that's good. Awesome. WebM has a course on Word PD. Yep, absolutely, for only 125 up, and I'm in the June cohort. Cor um, a company called DQ has DQ University. That's very popular. Level Access is another company, TPG. They also have their own versions of courses. Those tend to be paid, however. Uh, you're getting my time for free. But these are still good resources to go look into if you're curious to learn more, especially if you have developers. Um, they have some really good developer information. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, I've got two minutes left. Does anybody have any other questions? To be honest, Deborah, I'm not 100% positive, but I'm going to say yes. What do I feel about lynda.com? What I've found personally is they don't have a lot of stuff. Um, a site that I've used, there, there again, it's a paid site, is Plural Sites. Uh, they've actually got some really good accessibility content. They also offer um, some really good information about code and accessible code. So Plural Sites is a paid site, but it really does give you some good content and information about accessibility that I haven't quite found on Linda. Um, it can be. Uh, it's there again. What you put in is going to make a difference in terms of what the kids get out or your students get out. Seems to be an access issue when in an accessible mode. It's possible. Uh, Sally, do you want to answer that question? The presentation will be available somewhere. Yes, the, um, you will receive an email uh, next week with PDF slides and uh, links to the uh, recordings. Okay. Um, we are pretty much at time. We are. So I'm going to actually leave everybody here. Um, Thank you. You know how to get out to Sally. If there are additional questions that you want answered, you can always ping us at accessibility at blackboard.com. That comes to me and a few other folks. So depending on your questions, somebody will get back to you. Um, thank everybody for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you, Elizabeth. I will now turn off the recording. Thank you all very much for attending. Have a good evening. <laughs>